In this video, I'm going to explain how to analyze a camshaft and crankshaft position sensor waveform. This is a waveform we have taken and measured the voltage on the signal wires of the camshaft and crankshaft position sensors on the same waveform so that we can have both signals and compare and contrast them to each other and check the condition. Now there are a few basic things that we can find out from this waveform. First is we can identify the speed of the camshaft and crankshaft position sensors. Sometimes that's helpful to be able to know what RPM the engine was turning at at the point that we were testing this. The second thing that we want to check for is we want to look at the condition of the signals. We want to make sure that they're consistent and that the amplitude is high enough that the computer can detect the pulses and identify the speed and position of the camshaft and crankshaft position sensors. The third thing that we want to check, and this is a really important one, is the correlation between the camshaft and crankshaft position sensor timing. We can identify whether a, a timing belt or a timing chain is installed correctly and whether the camshaft timing is correct. We can also identify whether the variable valve timing is working or not. You'll notice that in this waveform we have a crankshaft position sensor and a camshaft position sensor. And on many of our newer model vehicles we'll have multiple camshaft position sensors because we have variable valve timing and we may have dual overhead cams which means that we have an exhaust camshaft and an intake camshaft on each bank. So on a V6 or a V8 engine you might even have four camshaft position sensors. This particular car only has one and it has one crankshaft position sensor. The way that we can tell that this is the crankshaft position sensor is that we know that the crankshaft spins at twice the speed of the camshaft. So if we come up here and identify the repeating pattern in the camshaft position sensor signal up here, we'll see that it repeats from there to there. That's one revolution of the camshaft. We can come down and see that the camshaft is turning at a speed of 819 RPM. At the same time, we can see the pattern in the crankshaft position sensor signal and see that it's a lot closer and smaller, which means that it's turning faster and it's currently turning at 1600 and 46 RPM, which is twice the speed of the camshaft. Now there are two different types of sensors, and you'll notice that in this signal. We have a square digital waveform here, and we have an analog waveform here. The two types of sensors that are commonly used for camshaft and crankshaft position sensor signals are a magnetic reluctance sensor and a digital Hall effect sensor. Now you'll notice that these two sensors look a lot alike. How you can identify them is that the magnetic reluctance sensor has two wires connected to it, while the Hall effect sensor has three wires connected to it, typically. And this sensor is the one that produces the analog signal. This one has a transistor built into it and there's a switch, and therefore it produces a digital or off and on signal, a square wave. Okay, back at the waveform, the next thing that we're going to look for is the condition of the signal. To identify the condition, we want to look for a repeating pattern. So in this camshaft position sensor, we'd like to zoom out and maybe even look at it over time and see if we are getting the same pattern over and over and we're not seeing changes in it. We're not seeing where it drops out or changes in these pulses. And the same thing is true of this crankshaft position sensor. Now on the analog signal, we're also very concerned about the amplitude. If the amplitude isn't high enough, the ECU doesn't detect the pulse, and it uses the frequency of these pulses to determine the speed of the crankshaft or the camshaft. And it uses these signature waveforms. You'll see the wider pulses here. It uses that to determine the position. So that's how we get a position and speed out of our sensors. In this case, as far as we can see here, both sensors have a consistent repeating pattern. You'll notice that as the engine RPM increases, that the frequency of these pulses increase. That's to be expected. You'll also notice that on the analog signal, the amplitude is increasing. And that's also what happens. You see how this increases as the RPM of the engine increases. We need to make sure that at idle, when the engine is not spinning at a high speed, that we have sufficient amplitude. It needs to cover enough of a voltage range here for the ECU to detect that. And to know what an acceptable voltage range is, you'll probably have to check in your service information. In this case, though, it's covering about an 8-volt range from about negative 1.5 volts up to a positive 6.5 volts. At this point, I want to show you an example of a waveform from another car where we were having problems with the amplitude. This particular waveform was taken from a car after the crankshaft position sensor was replaced.
Um, before it was replaced, there was a complaint of the car not starting sometimes, and there's also a DTC indicating a fault in the crankshaft position sensor, and that DTC is set when the crankshaft position sensor voltage doesn't have a high enough amplitude. And so I'm going to overlay the original waveform from the original crankshaft position sensor before it was replaced. I've already created a reference waveform of that other waveform so that I can turn this on and we can see them on top of each other. The purple waveform was the original crankshaft position sensor. Now we notice that there isn't a lot of difference, but you will notice that the amplitude is lower. Well, the service information told us that the amplitude needed to be above 5 volts in order for the ECU to detect the sensor signal. So I'll mark this off at 5 volts. It looks like most of the time that was happening. And that probably explains why most of the time what the car was starting weren't having issues. As we scroll across, we'll see that there are times when the amplitude isn't crossing that 5 volt threshold. And when we found this, we determined that the sensor needed to be replaced. And you'll see that after the sensor was replaced, we increased the amplitude on the high end by more than 2.5 volts and on the low end by more than 2.5 volts. And so that allowed the ECU to detect each of the pulses. And now the car starts every time and the DTC no longer sets. So that's an example of why we need to check the amplitude of the signal, even if it looks like the signal is in good condition and the pattern is consistent. Now the last thing, and maybe one of the most important things that we can learn from this signal, is the correlation between the camshaft and the crankshaft. In order to do that, we have to have a known good waveform. Otherwise, we don't know how they should correlate. So for example, I think that maybe one of the best places to mark these two waveforms off would be right here. I look at this pulse of the camshaft, and it appears that we have a wide high pulse, a medium sized high pulse, and then a thinner high pulse. And then that pattern repeats. So I'm going to this medium sized high pulse and just marking that and looking at how that correlates with the crankshaft. The reason I chose this one is because it correlates with this wider pulse. Now I want to pay attention that it's after the low pulse on this one and as it's beginning to rise that's where it should cross. And it should do that consistently. It should be in the same spot each time. Now, to know whether this is good or bad, we need to compare this to a known good waveform. But we can also use this to see if our variable valve timing is working or not. So to do that, I'm going to come to this waveform. In this particular car, there was a diagnostic trouble code stored saying that the variable valve timing wasn't working correctly. So as we can see, this is probably cranking. Then the RPM increased. And then right here, it idled. So let's come in here at idle and take a look at how the camshaft and crankshaft correlation is. I like to put the crankshaft below and the camshaft above just because I can picture that better. I'm also going to reduce the scale of this blue waveform a little bit so that we can look at it. Okay, you'll notice that this is the camshaft position sensor. It's turning at a slower rate than this one is. This crankshaft position sensor signal looks a lot like the one on that last waveform that we just saw. But the camshaft position sensor looks different. This is another analog or a magnetic reluctant sensor. You can see the repeating pattern. It has three pulses and then it has a blank spot and the three pulses and a blank spot. So we need to pick some place that we want to identify. So I might bring these rulers over and just mark off two revolutions of the crankshaft because it takes two revolutions of the crankshaft for the camshaft to turn once. And you'll see by default that it automatically marked it at 720 degrees, which is perfect. That's two revolutions. Now I want to notice the pause and then three pulses within these rulers that I just set up. If I set up the rulers differently, if I had set them up in this manner, I would have two pulses and then a blank and then a pulse. And it doesn't matter how I set them up, I just need to be consistent. Okay, now that I've marked off two revolutions of the crankshaft, I could get in here and become a little more accurate. I can come out here and I'm going to identify the first of the three pulses. And I'm going to look at where that happens. And it shows me that during these rotations, it happens at 252.4 degrees. Now, if this is an intake camshaft, the intake camshaft should advance as the engine RPM increases if I have variable valve timing, which means that the red trace should actually move to the left relative to the blue trace 
when the engine RPM increases. If it's an exhaust camshaft, it should do the opposite. It should retard, which means that the, the camshaft should move to the right relative to the crankshaft position sensor. So I want to remember this number, 252 degrees. Now let's move out here to a, to a spot where the engine RPM was much higher. You can see that the amplitude of both signals has increased, which makes it a little bit difficult because of the overlap. So I'll just reduce this to, so that we can see them both on the screen. Now let's do the same thing. Let's mark off two revolutions of the crankshaft, making sure that we start where we have a blank and then the three pulses in between the rulers here. As I mark this off, I will come out here and it looks like I'm at about 252 or 251 degrees again, which shows me that the camshaft did not advance in this case and is an explanation for why we're setting that DTC. Now there's one more condition that we can see with this waveform that's really helpful. And that is if we're ever questioning whether the timing between the crankshaft and camshaft is incorrect, this waveform will tell us that with a lot of accuracy. Otherwise, if you're concerned about the timing, you would have to remove the timing cover and inspect the marks on the timing chain sprockets or the timing belt sprockets to see if everything is correct. That can take a lot of time on some engines. This is a lot faster. We just have to measure the waveform and sit down at the computer and compare this to a known good waveform. So I'm going to show you an example on another waveform. This waveform is the camshaft and crankshaft position sensor signal of a Jeep Liberty, 2004 Jeep Liberty, 3.7 liter, no start condition. Um, actually, it turned out, though, that as we tried to start it, it did start most of the time, but it ran very poorly. So, as we look for the patterns here, it looks like this is the crankshaft position sensor signal. We can come out here and see what the RPM is. We'll find out right now whether this engine was running or just cranking. It looks like it repeats itself right there, approximately, which is at 1100 RPM. So that's definitely not cranking. This engine was running when this waveform was taken. If we look at the top, we look at this pattern, it has three high pulses, one and two, and then three, two, and one, and then it repeats. We had our suspicions that the timing was incorrect on this vehicle. And in order to find that out, we needed to compare this to a known good waveform. Now, I like to use IATN.net, but you have to have a subscription to that website. The waveform library on IATN.net is probably the most complete waveform library that I'm aware of, where I could typically find a known good waveform for just about any car that I'm working on. Um, and if you don't want to pay the subscription for that website, I've also been able to find these on Google by Googling images. So let's go out and see what we can find on Google right now for this vehicle. Now, as you can see, Google Images doesn't always bring up the right waveforms, and you'll see a lot of variety, and even within the same vehicle. So this Jeep Liberty may have had several different types of sensors throughout the years. And so depending on the year, you might get a different pattern. But I look here, and it looks like this second image right here has the same pattern as the waveform that I'm looking at. I can see the 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, 3, and then it looks like it repeats itself. So assuming that this is a known good waveform, I'm going to look for an identifying signal here. And something that I see is that every time we have a low wide pulse on the crankshaft position sensor, here and here, we'll see that this set of three pulses on the camshaft position sensor falls right in the middle of that. In fact, the middle pulse is just a little bit to the left. Because this is just an image, I can't actually measure how many degrees off this is, but I'm looking for that middle pulse of the set of three pulses to be just a little bit to the left of the first pulse after the wide low pulse on the crankshaft position sensor signal. So let's go back to our waveform. I'm looking for the set of three pulses. That middle pulse right there should be about right here. It looks like the camshaft position sensor is advanced just a little bit. 
let's pull these rulers out and see if we can find out how much that is advanced by marking off two revolutions of the crankshaft position sensor again finding out where that middle pulse occurs and looking at where you would like it to occur which is about right there now the difference between the spot that it is and the spot that we'd like it to be is about 57 degrees so that shows us our timing is off by about 57 degrees we found that the timing chain had been installed incorrectly now it's not always after an installation that things are off sometimes a sprocket can rotate on a camshaft a timing belt can skip a tooth things can happen that can make this timing be incorrect and this is a very fast and easy way to identify if your timing is incorrect now before I end I just want to show you a couple more waveforms this is a waveform of the pattern from a Chevy Aveo and as I zoom in I want to put the crankshaft position sensor down below and the camshaft sensor above I'm looking for a pattern in these so we can identify the engine RPM by coming out here and marking off one revolution of the crankshaft it looks like it's spinning at 835 rpm and also I noticed in the correlation I would probably have to go and count the number of, of pulses between here and here but I can see that really it looks to me like this signature in the crankshaft waveform is right in the center of this high pulse on the camshaft position sensor so that looks good so this car was also setting a DTC and having trouble running and was having very bad fuel economy. So let's, let's go out and scroll across and see if we see any problems with the pattern. Now I'm noticing right in here, it seems like this signature is getting skinnier. Right here, I think we're still in the center. But it looks like right here we're not. Now this rose, at the center again like it should but it looks like this shut off or this pulse dropped off too early it looks good in this area oh right in here it's happening again we can see that the pulse looked like it was pretty good here but then it got narrower and even narrower to shut off right here that shouldn't happen as far as correlation goes these two signals should stay correlated now this car does not have variable valve timing but even if it did, the RPM is not changing here. This car was just idling, and so there should be no change in correlation as we're going across. And even if I look at my overview down here, I can, I can identify the spots. You can see right here, here, and here. It looks a little bit different, and those are the spots where those pulses narrowed. And it turned out that the, we had a bad camshaft position sensor on this vehicle. Someone had installed a cheap aftermarket sensor and so we replaced it with the OEM sensor and that fixed this but that's that's an example of a quality issue on a sensor signal if you weren't careful you would think that this was okay but if you zoom out and look at it over a period of time you can see that there are times when this signal is changing I have one more pattern that I'll show you this particular vehicle had a complaint of rough idle and no power but it had no DTC stored so let's zoom in and take a look here okay at this point we can see the pattern and it looks an awful lot like one of the patterns we saw a minute ago we can see that the crankshaft position sensor signal looks good and the camshaft position sensor signal looks good there's a pattern but as we zoom out we notice that it doesn't always look like that we were in this section here but then a short time later let's come over here we'll see that the pattern starts to break down right here it looks good coming through this area and then right here we lose our crankshaft position sensor signal we know this isn't a mechanical issue because it would be happening consistently right we know that this is an issue with the signal on the sensor and then it breaks down and it gets worse and worse and it's amazing that this car even runs at all but it was running but a crankshaft position sensor repaired this problem and we were able to identify that using this waveform so these are just some examples of how to use your camshaft and crankshaft position sensor signals and to analyze the waveforms to check for the the quality of the signals, the amplitude of the signals, and also the timing or correlation between the signals to identify what's wrong with the vehicle. And I hope these examples helped you to see what you can learn from the waveforms and how this can be very useful.